All right, this is Carol Baggerly, and I'm here today with Dr. Michael Hollick of Boston University, one of the world's leading vitamin D researchers. And I'm absolutely delighted to also say that he's part of the Grassroots Health uh, Scientist Panel. Today we're here to talk about the very recent uh, publication, just last week I believe it was, uh, by Darup et al. about a U-shaped curve with cardiovascular mortality. We had a lot of people write in to say, should I be worried? So Dr. Hollick, how about starting with some kind of summary and then at least answer the question, should they be worried? No. Nope. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> So this is the problem from my perspective, Yes, it, and that is you have to ask the question for these U-shaped curves, whether it be for cardiovascular mortality or for prostate cancer, as they're suggesting from one of the Scandinavian studies, is who in their right mind is maintaining a blood level of 25-hydroxy vitamin D above 40 or 50 nanograms per ml, unless Two possibilities. One is that they may be uh, taking all kinds of supplements and as a result may be taking you know, mega things that could potentially increase risk. But the second and more likely possibility is that these patients are actually being treated for vitamin D deficiency. Because we know in the general population from Dr. the Hullick, National Health... Dr. Hullick, I want to interrupt you a second. You said who in their right mind would be above 40 nanograms per milliliter. That really is the minimum that we are suggesting. I know, but, this, but you have to remember that these studies are not today. These are retrospective studies. Thank you. Right? Good. And as a result, back then, they didn't know about vitamin D. Vitamin D supplementation is a, is a recent phenomenon. If you go back even to 2004, Thank you'll you. find that most pharmacies didn't even carry a vitamin D supplement. So yeah, thanks for the qualification. So you're absolutely right. I was going to finish with the comment that, yes, you're right, that in this day and age, we do recommend that people be at least 40. I'm personally at 60 nanograms per ml. So the second issue, and, and the most important one to me, is that, that back around 2000, 2003, a lot of these data were collected, that these patients were found to be vitamin D deficient, and they likely were being treated for vitamin D deficiency. And as a result, they still maintained their risk of being vitamin D deficient for increased risk for cardiovascular disease. Now, how can you answer that question? And so we recently published a paper, Dr. Kroll from Quest uh, is the first author in PLOS, where we looked at 3.8 million samples that were uh, evaluated at Quest Labs for 25 hydroxy vitamin D over a period of two years and asked two questions. The first is, how significant is vitamin D deficiency and insufficiency in the United States? And the answer is about 33% are deficient in general, 60% are deficient or insufficient, i.e. less than 30 nanograms per ml. But the second question we asked was, of the people that have blood levels of 25 hydroxy vitamin D above 50 nanograms per ml, what percentage of them had circulating levels of 25 hydroxy vitamin D2? Now, why did we ask that question? Because the only pharmaceutical form of vitamin D available to doctors in the United States to treat vitamin D deficiency is vitamin D2, because it predates the FDA. It doesn't mean you can't get 50,000 units of vitamin D3, but that's from a supplement manufacturer. It's not the pharmaceutical form. We found 59% of individuals with a 25-hydroxy vitamin D of greater than 50 nanograms per ml had 25-hydroxy vitamin D2 in their circulation, which means that they were likely being treated for vitamin D deficiency. Therefore, they were already had the risk for cardiovascular disease because they were chronically vitamin D deficient and only recently are now being treated for that vitamin D deficiency. And that's part of the problem that I have with a lot of these 
meta-analyses that are coming, that are coming out, out. They, they, they don't, don't ask fundamental, fundamental questions. questions. They, they simply, simply look at numbers. numbers. They're, They're basically bean counters. And, and all they do is they put the beans in different places, places and they, they say, see, those above 30, 40, 50 nanograms per ml, an increased risk for prostate cancer, for cardiovascular mortality. But they never ask the question because they don't have the information. Why do they have a blood level of 30, 40, or 50? And we think that the reason is, from most of the data that's retrospective from many years ago, is that, in fact, these patients were all vitamin D deficient, and they were taking pharmacologic doses of vitamin D to treat their D deficiency. With regards to studies like this, there also, I guess, I have a question about study design. Even if you're looking at old data or something, or maybe there could be some highlights into, and this study used how many tests? For example, on this one, there was only one test, one vitamin D test that was done. Is that not correct? But that's typically the way these studies are done. So what they do is that they have a, a, a cohort and, and, they'll, they'll, and they, they just have, have one blood sample. sample. And so, so all they do is, is that they take 7,000 or 5,000 5, people that they evaluated at day one. Right. They have a blood sample. Right. And then they ask the question 10 years later, what was their risk for prostate cancer or mortality? Right. And, and then they, they try to relate the two. Right. For just kind of a, a fun logic question, if indeed the assertion were true that uh, people with the levels above 40 nanograms per milliliter were at greater risk of cardiovascular uh, mortality, what would that imply about different regions of the earth? Sure. So, so what it actually implies is that, that probably humans, humans wouldn't be on the planet right now, right? Because, <laughs> because I mean, a hunter gatherer forefathers outside every day were exposed to sunlight all the time. Right. And as you're aware, the data from Luxwall suggests that Maasai warriors who are outside all the time, that they're maintaining blood levels of at least 40 nanograms per ml. So evolutionarily, I think that's probably where we all should be. And I think that's the reason, one of the reasons why the Endocrine Practice Guidelines Committee had recommended that the preferred range for 25-hydroxy vitamin D is about 40 to 60 nanograms per ml for 25-hydroxy vitamin D and up to 100 nanograms per ml is perfectly safe. Perfect, perfect. One of the things that we have done that I have not yet shared with you that I will right now is we took a quick look at our grassroots health cohort, which has thousands of individuals, and these thousands of individuals have serum levels in that 40 to 60 range. And we wanted to quickly see what is going on with cardiovascular disease in our cohort. And lo and behold, it's an almost flat curve. It really does not have any increase in um, incidence or prevalence uh, at the higher levels. So for certainly the people in our cohort, there is absolutely zero indication that that level would increase the risk. And Good I, to hear. I know, it's great. It's great to have all these lovely people out there doing that. The other thing that I wanted to highlight, again, from, from our, our cohort, the U.S. prevalence of cardiovascular disease is right at 36, 37 percent. And the mean serum level, vitamin D serum level, is 26 nanograms per milliliter. Within our cohort, the uh, prevalence is 6.29 percent. And our serum level mean is about 46 nanograms per milliliter. So we obviously have a more healthy cohort for all kinds of reasons, right. which I'm delighted about. Well, Dr. Hollick, that's it for today. Uh, do you have further things that you would like to say on this? We'd be happy to hear them. Well, I mean, the, the um, only other comment, of course, is that Dr. Garland had just published recently when he looked at 25-hydroxy vitamin D levels and related it to risk for mortality, that unlike many of the studies that are out there, he found that the curve continued to decline. And even you were still receiving benefit at around 40 to 50 nanograms per ml. So I think that, that people should not be concerned about 
having a 24 oxy vitamin D level at 40 to 60 nanograms per ml. Like I said, mine is 60, and I feel perfectly happy and healthy. And I have all of my patients that are on equivalent of two to 3,000 units of vitamin D a day. I maintain their blood levels in the 40 to 60 nanogram per ml range, and have not really seen any negative consequences. So I think that it is important for your listeners to realize that it is important to improve your vitamin D status because it may not only improve your cardiovascular health but actually reduce your risk of many chronic illnesses throughout your life. Thank you and for those who don't already know about Grassroots Health you can find out more about our projects with vitamin D on grassrootshealth.net and we, through our study, we are providing a vitamin D test. Uh, in order to know what your serum level is, you have to test it. And we provide that. Um, and you can test and answer a questionnaire and contribute to all the great information that we are sharing. Dr. Hollick, again, thank you so much for coming. My pleasure. Have a great day. Thank a delightful you. day at, 